Brethren, we were speaking about the magnitude of Christ's sacrifice, and last Sabbath we have already covered much, and we came to Second Samuel last Sabbath, and that was chapter 12. We came to the situation when Prophet Nathan approached David, because David was not aware of the magnitude of his sins. And the Prophet Nathan appear, approaches David and gives him a story. In that story he portrays a rich man, that's actually David, who killed the only, uh, the only <laughs> pet, the only, the only sheep that a uh, poor man had, and because the, the 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 rich man got an unexpected visitor, so he 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 took instead of one of his, he took from the sheep of 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 his poor neighbor and so on. And uh, David was enraged. And in verse thirteen, he said to Nathan, "I have." Uh, he finally, when he realizes it is it is him that is the rich man in the story. He says in verse 13, so David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And then, you know, he immediately recognized it was it was primarily sinning against the Lord. However, then Nathan told him in uh, in verse 14 that he will not die because the, the Lord has put away your sin, you shall not die. But however, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. So that child shall surely die in the stead of David. If David was taken care of and killed, brethren, then the problem is resolved and the child could have lived. Now, of course, thinking carnally, we'll be thinking, oh, how could God allow this innocent child to be, you know, to be, uh, to die as the result of the sins of his parents? Well, brethren, we have to understand this. Uh, David had his salvation at stake the child did not. And therefore the child died in David's stead because David pronounced the death penalty. And not just the child, a thousand years from now, another child would be born to David, of the lineage of David, who would also have to die. This child was only a type. And we know from the story that David fasted for seven days and besieged God to spare life of the child. And it could not could not be because no one could stop what was absolutely necessary what was absolutely necessary was the death of Jesus Christ and no man beseeching and pleading to God in that time to prevent the crucifixion of Jesus Christ could have stopped it from happening the death of Christ had to happen and this child was a type of death even Jesus died, denied his death You know, he pleaded that he would not have to die that way remember when he was praying if this cup may just you know, pass Pass me, but no, no, no amount of pleading, even on the part of Jesus Christ, could stop what had to be. This child had to die, and a future child of David would have to die to make David's salvation possible. In verse 10, there was another part of trouble and curse that would come upon David for what had happened. Uh, now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. So look, David, God is saying, you know, I could have given you peace. I could have given you rest from all your enemies. But because of what you have done, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me. You need to realize, brethren, that the uh, European royal families all descend from the house of David. All the, the, the most renowned, of course, is the British royal family. But all the others also descend, are descendants of David. David had numerous wives and numerous children. So the European royalties descend from him. And uh, the history of those royal families is marred by all kinds of intrigues, uh, assassinations, uh, evil things anyway. That's exactly the fulfillment of verse 10. That was the prophecy. And uh, David never thought in terms of despising God when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And when he murdered her husband. But God said, you know, that is what it demands. That is another reason why sin is against God. We are despising God and despising his laws. So now David saw for uh, that for the rest of his reign, he would be troubled by warfare on his borders. But not only that, look at verse 11. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I'll raise up adversity against you from your own house. And I'll take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. So he will suffer foreign war, but from his own house would come a war, a civil war, domestic strife, 
His own son Absalom would rebel against him and 20, 23,000 people in Israel would die who would not otherwise have died, brethren. You see what the magnitude of sin is and why the magnitude of Jesus Christ's sacrifice is for us and why he died in our stead. Nevertheless, this world continues to sin and live in sin. And that's why we see the destruction all over the place. The Ukrainian, current Ukrainian government, uh, Ukrainian uh, crisis is one of the examples. The possible destruction coming to Taiwan is another example and so on and so forth. But once again, let me just emphasize lest you have missed to understand. David's salvation was at stake. Because brethren, David had the Holy Spirit. Had he lost the Holy Spirit, he would have lost his salvation. The child that was born from this adultery, the child did not have the Holy Spirit. And the salvation was not yet offered to that child, you see. And because of that, the child which died could not have lost its salvation. Its salvation is still in future. So that child is going to come up in the second resurrection. He's going to grow up in a beautiful world. And it's going to have its own chance for eternal life. Uh, so that's why the child died instead of David. That's why that child is a type of another child that will be born from the lineage of David. And will have to die for not only for David, but also for the rest of humanity, meaning for all of us. So that's why the child died. But again, that's not it's not unjust as carnal mind would think because the child is going to come up again to life in a much better world. David's salvation was at stake. If David lost the Holy Spirit, that would be it for David. So you see how God was nevertheless merciful still to this great sinner of David, how merciful he is to all of us as well. So when David heard what Nathan told him, he was left with one very obvious thought, that as the result of his sin, a lot of people were going to get hurt. 23 thousand are just those that died in the civil war. We have no record in the Bible of how many had died unnecessarily in foreign wars defending the borders. Now when David came to the point that he understood the full measure of what he had done, or was beginning to understand the full measure of what he had done, he made a public proclamation as a result of his sin with Bathsheba. You might remember that Nebuchadnezzar also made a public proclamation too after his experience of punishment from God when he was mad for seven years and then his sanity was restored to him. He made a proclamation to the known world at that time and that letter, you might remember, it's written only in Daniel chapter 4, that letter from Nebuchadnezzar was dispatched to all the territories that he ruled in the Babylonian Empire. It is recorded for us in Daniel 4. Don't go there, I'm just uh, reminding you. In Daniel 4, where he spoke, Nebuchadnezzar, how God dealt with him. And he said, well, the, the God that Daniel was serving is the true God that he now, as a, well, Nebuchadnezzar never, never, was never converted, but nevertheless he recognized that the God of Israel was the true God. Interesting, brethren, very interesting. The main despot of that world, the main dictator of the world, nevertheless, recognized the true God. He never believed in the true God. He never got converted, but he did recognize him. Now, and he made that public. It was a public proclamation. Now, David also made a public proclamation to the world. Let us now turn to Psalm 49. And before we read these three Psalms, I want to bring our attention to this, brethren. Psalm 51 is recognized as being written by David at the time of Bathsheba and what happened. Psalm 49 and 50 are not recognized that way. In fact, the commentaries give other interpretations of those these two psalms, none of them relating to David and the time of Bathsheba. It has been sp speculated, though, that these two psalms could fit into that time. And they preface Psalm 51, and also they indicate the three stages of repentance that we have been talking since last Sabbath, and those three stages are seeing what we have done, seeing what we are, and finally seeing what we have really done. 
Now here is one possible interpretation of Psalm 49 and 50. Some of the verses may not fit, they may not seem to fit at all. Again, I'm not saying that this is definitely something that was put together by David at the time of Bathsheba, because other commentaries would not take it in that line. But there is a distinct possibility, as you will see, that these two prefaced Psalm 51. So a public proclamation, Psalm 49, verse 1. Hear this, all peoples, give ear, all inhabitants of the world. So this wasn't just for Israel, brethren. This wasn't just for the house of Israel. This is for all the nation, for all the nations around the world. Verse 2, both low and high, rich and poor together. Remember the parable of Nathan about the rich man and the poor man. My mouth shall speak wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall give understanding. Now David meditated long and hard on what had happened. I'll incline my ear to a proverb, the proverb of Nathan. I'll disclose my dark saying on the harp. In other words, I'm going to expose to you what is deep inside me, what I really feel I have done. Here is my dark saying. Verse 5. Why should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity at my heels surrounds me? You know, after all, I'm a king. I'm untouchable. So what if people begin to find out that I committed adultery with Bathsheba and that I killed her husband? I'm untouchable because I'm king. Why shall I fear in the days of my evil when the iniquity at my heel would surround me, when people begin to find out what happened? In other countries, kings do what they want, so they get away with it. Why should not I? This was my dark saying. My inward thought before God took me in hand. Then we continue in the psalm. Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches. Now, brethren, who had more riches than David at that time? A multitude of riches. The rich man of the parable but cannot give a ransom for himself because none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. In other words, David is saying, I cannot bring Uriah back to life. If I could give up all my wealth to make it possible, I would have done so. I would do so. But my brother is dead and he is going to stay dead. For the redemption of their souls is costly and it shall cease forever. That he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. For he sees wise men die. Likewise, the fool and the senseless person perish and leave their wealth to others. <laughs> So David is saying, I thought I was wise, but I found out that I am a fool and that I am a senseless person and they leave their wealth to others as I will. Their inner thoughts is that their houses will last forever. Their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. <laughs> you know, for God said to me before Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and this is verse 12. When your days are fulfilled, then you rest with your fathers. I'll set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I'll establish his kingdom. This is the prophecy of Solomon. Verse 13, he shall build a house for my name, and I'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now in verse 16 of Second Samuel chapter 7, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Well, this was my inward thought then, that my house will continue forever, my dwelling place to all generations, and they call their lands after their names. Well, in Second Samuel chapter 12, at the end of that same chapter, we find that Joab was fighting against Rabbah of the people of Ammon. And in verse 27, and Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah, and I have taken the city's water supply. Now therefore gather the rest of the people, together and encamp against the city and take it lest I take it and like, lest I take the city and it be called after my name. It was to be named after David because he was so famous, brethren. The psalm continues. Nevertheless, man, though in honor, does not remain. He is like the beast that perish. And David is saying, look, I've come to realize that I'm no better than an animal. This is the way of those who are foolish and of their posterity who approve their sayings. Selah. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. The upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, in the resurrection. 
and their beauty shall be consumed in the grave far from their dwelling. Now the next verse, verse 15, may seem not to fit uh, because we need to remember that David was in a state of repentance and therefore the sin would be covered. So verse 15 says, But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Salah. He shall receive me because of my repentance. Because of Psalm 51, where that repentance is being uh, expressed. So this psalm was David's proclamation. He was in covered language, speaking of what he had done as the rich man. It was what he had done. He wished he could undo it. He would have given all his wealth to pay the price for Uriah to bring him back to life, but he could not redeem the soul of his brother. brethren. So David repented of what he had done. But David also had to repent of what he was. So God made a proclamation to the world. Now the next psalm says a psalm of Asaph. Now it can be translated as a psalm for Asaph because it is, if it is for Asaph, then most likely, once again, it was written by David. And this time, it is God's proclamation. So Psalm 949, David's proclamation to the world. Now God's proclamation because God had a lesson yet to get across to David. Psalm, and it says, Psalm of Asaph, The mighty God, the mighty one, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. In other words, it's to every corner of the globe. Now God goes on and speaks to the kingdom of people of Israel before he narrows it down to the individual. Verse 7. Hear, O my people, and I'll speak, O Israel, and I'll testify against you. I am God, your God. We have a hymn very well known that we, when we sing this Psalm 50. I'll not rebuke you for your sacrifices or burnt offerings, which are continually before me. And brethren, in David's reign, they were before God continually, because David made sure that the people would continue to be offering the sacrifices. But God says, I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. In other words, God says, I don't need these things. Verse 13, will I eat the flesh of the bulls or drink the blood of goats? Well, yes, God says, I have commanded them, but none of the sacrifices can make up for right spirit and a right attitude and a repentant, contrite heart. Now, this is the real sacrifice I want. Offer to God thanksgiving, and particularly thanksgiving for the wonderful forgiveness He has given us for sin, and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I'll deliver you, and you shall glorify me. And David was going to be faced with many days of troubles, for the rest of his reign, brethren, because, uh, you know, that's what God said and he prophesied. However, God also did deliver David. And now it narrows it down to the individual, verse 16. But to the wicked God says, What right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth? Who most declared, you know, the God of Israel at that time? Well, it was David. For as the king went, so went the nation. Look, David, what, what, what are you doing? Declaring my statutes, although you should take my covenant in your mouth, because God made a special covenant with David in Second Samuel chapter 7. Seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind. In other words, you preach one thing out of your mouth, David, but for a whole year you lived a totally different way of life from that which you preach. And you did not condemn yourself. Look at yourself. Look at your self-righteous indignation when you heard the parable of Nathan. And you are going to put that man to death because of one little lamb. You killed a human being and you stole his life. Verse 18. When you saw a thief, you consented with him and have been a partaker with adulterers. You see, David, you murdered a man so you can steal his wife. You are being a partaker with adulterers. David committed adultery, which was stealing another man's wife. Yes, but he went beyond that, brethren. He killed that man so that he can then make that woman his wife. So something that should have never happened. Uriah should have lived. So David was a thief as well as an adulterer. Verse 19. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. 
for several months, David, you plotted and con- connived and you planned how to work it out that Uriah would think that the child was his. And when you couldn't finally work that out, you finally conspired to kill him. You gave your mouth to evil and your tongue to deceit. Verse 20. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. Well, that's because, you know, Uriah, brethren, was like a brother to David. A loyal, faithful servant. It's like a slandering on your own mother's son because you thought evil of Uriah. You hated the fact that he wouldn't comply with what you wanted done so that he would think that the child was his. And finally, you went to the ultimate course of killing him. Verse 21. These things you have done, and I kept silent. For a whole year, David, I said nothing. And of course, in the course of that, you thought that I was such as one of yourself. You wouldn't repent You thought that I was altogether like you, but I'll rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. I sent Nathan to you. So verse 22, now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. David's salvation, brethren, was on the line. Verse 23, Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, in other words, he that changes his ways and repents, I'll show the salvation of God. David was the one to be shown salvation of God. David saw what he had done, wished he could undo it. Now God was telling him what he was, what he was like. Romans chapter 2 say, about judging others when we do the same things, brethren. Romans 1 talks about Gentiles and what they have done. Romans 2 condemns the Jews because they were condemning the Gentiles for what they have done, thinking, well, we don't do that. And Paul says, oh, yes, you do. You may not have done the physical action of committing adultery and therefore think, well, I'm so righteous because I haven't done it. But you have done it. You have done it up here with the mind. You see, brethren, some people, when they want to be baptized, they can say, well, I see certain things I have done, but they don't have, you know, the concept that every day they will li- they have lived on the face of the earth, they were sinning against God. Not by living, but because of what their mind was thinking every day of their life. Sin is not just what we have done. It is what we are. Psalm 51. Now after God's proclamation, David began to see far more of what his sin entailed. Have mercy upon me, O God. David could not have said that God was merciful to others. You know, I've been kind. I've let people off. Please be merciful to me. David was the man in the parable who reached out and took what wasn't his and had no pity. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgression. My transgressions, that is, in plural. Well, those are indeed transgressions in plural. Stealing, adultery, lying, murder, the whole gamut. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Because there was no way David could wash off that blood from his hands, brethren. God had already told him in the preceding psalm that no animal sacrifice would take care of it. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. A horror of what he had done. And then in verse 4, Against you, you only have I sinned. In Second Samuel he said, I have sinned against the Lord. But now there is a greater emphasis on it, brethren. Against you, you only have I sinned. So David had murdered a man, he used his wife, brought about the death of their child, Absalom ultimately died, 23,000 other people died, and how many other thousands suffered, we don't know. But David says here in verse 4, Compared with what I have done to you, God, all that begins to pale into insignificance. He wasn't that if, you know, it didn't mean anything to him, what other people would suffer. He wrote Psalm 49 in that context, if that speculation is correct. But he began to see what he had done to God. And it was more than just 
transgressing God's laws. Well, you know, to whom was he praying after all? To whom was he praying here in this, in this psalm? No, it is not the Father. It says in the New Testament that Jesus Christ came to reveal the Father. So, Daniel was praying to the God of the Old Testament. He was praying to Jesus Christ. The God that David was down on his knees in front of. The God whose mercy he was begging. The God he was crying out to was the God who was going to have to die and die horribly in order for David's sins to be blotted out. It may well have been that at this point David realized that he had con condemned his God to death. The God of whom he prayed was the God who was going to have to suffer terribly. Verse 16, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. Well, the only way I can come through this is what with a repentant heart. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Brethren, no animal sacrifice could have atoned for the sin. It says in Hebrews 10 verse 4, For it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Now it would require the sacrifice of God himself, the God to whom David was praying, David had prayed. And only the true, only true repentance over that sacrifice, discerning the Lord's body, can bring forgiveness. The forgiveness spoken of in verse 17. Now, what tore David apart at the end? What shattered him to the point that he got down on his knees and deeply and bitterly repented in a way that he had not done before? He repented before, but never to the, the same depth, brethren. What really got to him was when he realized what was going to happen to God. It was a thousand years distance for David, two thousand years behind us. He began to understand the full gravity and magnitude of sin. That is not, it is not just breaking God's law. It is the breaking of God himself. The God must die and die a terrible death to get across to us how terrible sin is and its consequences. Do we think that David understood what the, that death was going to be like? Well, he was the principal prophet to whom God prophesied that death. Let's go to Psalm 22. This psalm was written earlier by David. It is clear from the psalm that he is not talking about himself. If it was written earlier, if God inspired it earlier, then David would... Well, then David went back and read it now with a whole new understanding. It may, however, be that God, after Psalm 51, inspires Psalm 22. Well, we may say, but that does not follow the sequential order. Other psalms are not written in sequential order from the standpoint of being consecutive in time. Psalm 32 is recognized by the commentaries as related to Psalm 51 that it was written at the same time. But you know, you don't find the same topic in Psalm 52, but uh, in Psalm 32, uh, you, you find the same topic. There are books and, uh, well, because there are books and divisions in the Bible. Now, the Psalms were placed according to subjects, not according to the time in which they were written. So if Psalm 32 was written at the same time as Psalm 51, and the commentaries generally agreed on that, then Psalm 22 could have been written after Psalm 51, when David really began to understand what God was going to have to go through. Maybe it was at that point that the God to whom he was praying in Psalm 51 revealed to him what it would take, you know, to cover David's sins. But if it was written earlier, that he must have gone and back and he must have read, read it with a new understanding. Psalm 22, he was reading it with a new understanding indeed. Now we mentioned earlier 
that this was the greatest gamble in all eternity, brethren. In all of eternity, that was the greatest gamble because God risked his eternal Godhead. In, it says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, 6, 7, Let this man be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ, who being the, in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. So he gave up his Godhead. Was there a possibility that he would never get it back again? Yes. Yes, but it's true that Jesus Christ was born in uh, of the Spirit through Mary. He didn't have a human father. His father was God. Now, Mary was pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's true that you know he had the Holy Spirit given to him as a gift of God from birth. And it's also true, as the Bible says, that Jesus Christ had the Holy Spirit without measure. But, it, but despite all those three advantages, Christ still had human nature that was imparted to him from his mother. And Jesus Christ was a free moral agent, you know. So to manage three, 33 and one half years without one single sin of the mind, let alone the action, is utterly incredible. And one single sin would have take, would have blown it all. One single, th- you know, sin. Now, when Satan put uh, a tempting thought into his mind, if at any, if at any one time he had entertained that thought, his sacrifice would not have been perfect, brethren, and you and I would not be in this service today. And Jesus Christ would not exist, period. We need to understand what would have happened if Jesus Christ had failed. Well, we may think that with all those three advantages begotten by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb, with God's Spirit from birth, and the Spirit without measure, that surely he had it made. But uh, if Jesus Christ was not sure he could win, why did he fast 40 days before he took on that great uh, temptation with Satan in the wilderness? You know... uh, If Jesus Christ was so sure he could make it through the crucifixion without sin, why did he beg God to do it some other way and to spare him crucifixion? Brethren, Jesus could have failed. That is why he said, By myself have I sworn. He was willing to give up his eternity that we might share salvation with him. If Jesus had failed... Satan would have had the last laugh on God and this earth would have been incinerated. Brethren, God said he would would be destroyed by a flood, but the incineration of this earth would have come much earlier anyway. So if when Jesus Christ was being crucified, he had yielded to one thought of hate, that would have been it. Without that perfect sacrifice, there will be uh, no salvation for us and there would be no fulfillment of the promises to Abraham because they were dependent on that perfect sacrifice. Abraham would have died, uh, well, he would have died, of course, and he would have lied that, that forever if Jesus Christ failed. And Jesus Christ would have been dead forever too. And what would be the reason for carrying out? What would be the reason to going on, you know, To let human beings live in Satan's world with no chance of redemption? Well, God would have had it, God would have had to destroy it and to put everyone out of his or her misery. And probably would have destroyed it by fire as he will do with the third resurrection. Now Jesus would have died for his own sins and stayed dead. God would not resurrect him for two reasons. First of all, because of his vow. By myself I have sworn. I have laid my eternal existence on the line. And secondly, if Jesus had begun to go the way of sin earlier on, if when Satan said, bow down and worship me and I'll give you all these things, if Jesus said, okay, I'll do it, well, God could have never resurrected him, brethren. Because if Jesus had begun 
to entertain sin and to and go the way of of sin if god had made him god again then the two gods would have waged war on each other with two foreign minds as lucifer when he became perverted began to wage war on god now god the father would have been left to himself as a god being forever with no chance no possibility of any other god beings ever existing because he himself couldn't have come down to this earth and do it after jesus christ was dead there would be no one to rule the universe and to rule the angels so who would have you know who would have resurrected god in the family from the dead if he had died for us well satan would have had the last laugh of god yes god could have committed him to the outskirts of the universe but satan would have always had the satisfaction of knowing i killed god psalm 22 david read this with new and tremendously deep and profound understanding he understood now what is god and what is that God would have to go through to make his salvation possible? A child would have been born to him a thousand years later who would also die in his stead. Verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know this was uttered by Jesus Christ from the stake. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, I am not silent. You see, because of six hours that he was at stake, three of them were daylight and three of them were uh, were utter night because God covered the earth with darkness for three hours. And yet, though even God wasn't answering him it as it seemed, he justified God. Verse three: But you are holy, enthroned in the presence of in the praises of Israel. Verse seven: All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip, they shake their head, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him, let him deliver him, let, since he delights in him. Now, we can read about that in Matthew 27, how people laughed at him. Matthew 27, verse 43, almost the exact same words from the Pharisees said, He trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while my, while on my mother's breasts. What is he? Because that's because Jesus Christ was called from day one. I was cast upon you from birth from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Well, it was God, brethren, by His Spirit that beget Jesus Christ in the womb of Mary. Verse 12. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan uh, have encircled me. Now, of course, this is metaphorically speaking because he looked like torn by bulls after being scourged by the Roman soldiers. Verse 14. I am poured out like water and my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. You see, as they lifted the tree, the tree of, of crucifixion, as they lifted that tree up and dropped it to the ground, all his bones were put, were basically out of joint. Verse uh, 16. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Dogs, of course, referring to Gentiles, to Romans. They pierced my hands and my feet. Well, this is so clearly not David, brethren. Christ inspired this to be written through David. And if it is, and if it wasn't at the time of Psalm 51, then certainly David, David read it with a new understanding. But then, the psalm that speaks of the terrible sufferings goes on to emphasize something positive and wonderful. The thing that Jesus Christ uh, was going through, the thing that kept him as he was going through it all, was vision. Now, the vision of what was beyond his sufferings, just as we must remain 
uh, must remain in vision, we must maintain the vision, brethren, because as Paul said, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. This is, of course, from Romans 8.18. So, hanging there on the stake, Jesus was able to say that the day will come, verse 22, when I'll declare your name to my brethren, In the midst of the assembly, I'll praise you. I'm going to live again and a whole new life. Verse 23. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glory him. And fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. You see, God had to put me through it. Yet, nor has he hidden his face from him. But he, but when he cries to him, he heard. Verse 25. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I'll pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. The meek, rather than poor should be in this verse, brethren. The meek shall eat and be satisfied because, you know, they shall come to eat my Passover to partake of, and uh, through the bread and the wine of my body and my blood, and then they shall be satisfied. You know, they shall have salvation. Verse 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. Well, in other words, brethren, salvation will one day be open to all humankind. Verse 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. Verse 30, speaking of us in this room, speaking of us in this call, a posterity shall serve him. I will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. So these are the next generations. You know, we are one of those generations because it was recounted the, the eras of God's church from the time of Jesus Christ's death to now, you know, he has been recounted, you know, to the next generation. And verse 31, they will come, not only will they, but they will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born. And uh, we declare it today to this end time generation, brethren, that he has done this. That the God who made men became men and died of four men. You know. Brethren, when we partake in about five days, we'll be partaking of the Passover. When we partake of the Passover, we must discern the Lord's body. We must discern what Jesus Christ was willing to go through for us and what he put at stake. He put at stake his own eternity. Now, because if we are to preach this coming salvation to all humankind, we, we of all people must know what what makes that salvation possible in our own lives is the magnitude and tremendous sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And if we are to preach this coming salvation to all men and all women, of all people, we must know what makes that salvation possible indeed in their lives and what makes it possible in our lives.